certainly if I were he and going to make a trip like this to Dallas, I'd make a point to visit him for a while. And then if I came back here and was going to go to Mexico for uh, reasons which might expose me later on, I would make a point later in the summer to go back to California again and come to Mexico from California. Then later I've got a natural. Why did you go through Dallas in May? If anybody saw me, I'm on my way to California. Why did you go to Mexico in September? I was on my way back from California. I'm just thinking out loud. All we have is what he's shown us. A man whose word is, is obviously questionable in certain areas because he conflicts himself from time to time. So I think the answer to that, John, is it would be a good working approach, although we don't have, we don't even have a little letter from a stewardess or whoever it was from, but it'd be a good working approach to assume that just because he went to California in May and says he got back to New Orleans in September, that it was entirely possible he spent much of the summer here. He only mentions a few jobs and uh, that uh, mentions them in passing, but that's all the more reason for, as a matter of fact, he gives us the time he was fired. He mentioned being fired from one. He seems bright enough that he wouldn't be fired from something unless he wanted to be. That's worth keeping in mind. He's not uh, the intellectual he thinks he is, but he's bright enough to hold any small. Let me just take a look at that summer for one moment. Summer 1963. Yeah, just for a moment. Since we're on the subject, won't take long. Let me get away from that. You don't mind if I skip over the Nazis you discovered. <laughs> Strange how his novels aren't finally published. page number of his I found where they stayed together. Not the same time, but at different times, but at the most obscure hotel. Right down the uh, uh, Beetham, and I'll think of it. That's, that would be in the original throwing it final, which has been picked up. Here, um, left town for a visit to California early May of 63. about it's all internal reflections and they mention this return from California to Mexico City in September 63. Well, this is gratuitous, so we're not too binding there. I just want to find those jobs. We key on Barbara to find out approximately what dates they're seeing the Ryder Coffee House. You got a note to follow through on that? You got to follow through on, on the possible dates for letter. I mean, well, I can put it down, but yeah. look, all I need is a few more notes. I'm out of commission. We have a we have a little problem which uh, Judge just pointed out to me with respect to the grand jury testimony and the files. Didn't uh, Mr. Gervich has just taken over as the chief investigator of right? the DA's office? Uh, all the more reason to have the initial approach made to the attorney general. Mr. Gervich won't be shifted to him. Here we are. Let's just we'll just touch base since since it's come up, and uh, because it is a problem, we there is a has to be a relationship of uh, some kind with uh, Marina. Uh, uh, if those witnesses are correct, 
as I previously indicated in early May of 1963. Again, same phrase, no date. Second or third time. During the spring of 63, doesn't say summer, I worked in a restaurant directly across from Disneyland part of the time and lived in a hotel in Anaheim. His family lives in uh, Whittier, of course. After that, I worked for a while at XX Mitchell's restaurant in East Whittier, finally toward the end of summer. So at this point, naturally, if we're able to have a checkout made out there, might be one of the later things we want to do so it doesn't ring too many bells, but if we did that, it would be interesting to know how long he worked for XX Mitchell's restaurant. But he says, I worked for a while. But he worked two weeks there. And he says, finally, towards the end of summer, I wound up working at Trapper's Inn. So, and he claims he worked there until August. So, really, the question can be answered if, and you have to knock on wood uh, 14 years later, but it may be possible to get an idea uh, how long he worked at these places. It's not beyond the realm of possibility. It's something we'd like to do if we can you all can find the manpower down the line. So we have a question that rises there, but I'm, not, I'm emphasizing this doesn't create it. It's just, uh, it's a separate lead that creates it. This, this is, uh, I don't see a problem with the memo I just gave you. As long as, uh, as long as the sightings are not in the summer, with KT, then I've got a problem. I don't know of any significant ones, that, but that we can go through the I whole thing. I can't think of any uh, that were in the summer. They were all in September and up and down. And we don't, uh, we don't know what, uh, maybe Mr. Beckham can help us with, uh, <coughs> with that. Have you all, uh, I mean, I don't want you to give me anything you don't have to, but between those in the field and managerial. I sense it, I smell it, it's just no way around it. He's protected too much. Did, did, did you have, do you have a feeling that he may have been responsible for the death of some people? Would you think he'd capable of that? I don't uh, like to speculate. Uh, uh, um, I lean over backwards in, in this area. But I'll tell you one thing I think, and uh, I think that Chrisman is very possibly the third man on the grassy you knoll. There has been such alteration in the photographs that by the time you see a 20th copy like Gayton had the other day, that's an old copy. I had early copies because I was getting Al Chapman, although I must, of Dallas, it was his idea. And, but I was encouraging him to get me those photographs and other photographs from a friend of his who worked for, I think, the Dallas Morning News in the morgue or something. And uh, we were giving him something like a dollar a piece, <laughs> which is really outrageous. But uh, anyway, so what Al was sending me was like sec second generation or something like that. And I had all five or six or whatever the whole set is. And uh, in most of them, the third man is systematically almost, it's too often, he's all, his face is always out of the camera. They don't mind you seeing the one they call Frenchy. Uh, they can see the cameras in front of them, apparently. And they don't seem to mind you seeing the big the bigger towels of one, although you don't know how big he really is, because if you look at it closely, he seems to be wearing two-inch elevator suit. But the early pictures of the third man where he is clear are very good photogra photographs of Lee Christman. Um, so I uh, just kept them here. Um, I uh, was looking forward uh, when the time came that you all did come down so I could show you a good photograph of Lee Christman. And uh, I've now ransacked my office about ten times in the last uh, month or two. And every picture showing the third man is gone. Uh, 
I, I'm afraid I got careless. I locked some things up, but I really didn't think they'd be bothering my office anymore, and I left them in the drawer. Suffice it to say that I've gone from a full set of The Walking Men to a handful of pictures of The Walking Men, and none of which the third tramp is clearly visible. As a matter of fact, the uh, uh, my questions of Christmas at the grand jury will undoubtedly center around him being in Dallas. And I cannot remember his answers because I was shocked when I saw him. In other words, it so clearly resembled a third man. The picture that Gaten has, which is the current picture going around, is uh, he's been blondined and faded and uh, so that if you anybody gets an early edition like I have, and then the late edition, they'll see two totally different people. What I'm saying is, is it's, it's very subjective when you talk about pictures, but I am confident that the early editions uh, uh, um, are certainly is a strong, too strong a word to use for a photograph. Um, it would be very hard to eliminate Lee Christmas from that. You now that is just the beginning. The rest of it was just, uh, uh, you might say, uh, in a way, intuition is an accumulation of memory where you don't always remember the details. I no longer remember the details of his testimony, but it was entirely too smooth and too professional for uh, a minister of a non-existent church, just as his background was. So, the uh, I knew Christmas was something by then. But uh, we never did get a chance to really bring our operation into focus when we were over with and out. Is there, is there anything about Bannister's death that may, uh, and, and Christmas movements around that period of time that may lead one to want to look into that a little closer? In other words, uh, where was Christmas and what did Bannister die of? Is there a problem with the uh, autopsy? I told you there were two empty files. I meant to say there were three empty files I had, uh, I found. Uh, one, but the only three people that turned out to be really, that we really had developed uh, some interesting material on. Uh, Christmas, Crayford, and Thornley. Other people, the files are this thick, untouched. Hall, two files. But anyway, uh, with regard to that activity, that would be the summer of 1964. Uh, I had not, uh, by the time I was questioning him, I know I had not learned from Phyllis yet that uh, Mary Bannister had called these friends of hers and said, Guy has been shot. So before that, I just, I sent for the coroner's autopsy, and I read it, and it indicated natural causes. So I know I didn't even go into that. If I had had the benefit of uh, knowing that, I probably would have asked a few questions. Now, Mary Bannister made a call to some friends and said the guy's been shot. Do we know who the friends were? I can't think of their names, but I can get it. I think that would be extremely interesting. Um, let me see. No, I better not ask over the phone. We're on a 50-50 phone, I guess, here. And there's just enough for somebody to drop by indirectly and scare him or something. I'll ask her that tonight and send it to you in a separate note. See, this is things for me to do. Can we, uh, we should call Shot in the head with a gun. We should call Cliff. Uh, start a Christian file with those two anonymous letters in the Beckham file. You know, usually I, I don't like anonymous letters because when a person doesn't sign his name. But on the other hand, you've got to have a little, little more leeway with regard to anonymous letters in the case of John Kennedy's murder, where so many people have subsequently been killed. Uh, a lot of people that would normally sign their name won't. So I got 
I went through all letters, anonymous or otherwise, and I came up with two letters, which I eventually put in the Beckham file. Do you, do you remember seeing I remember them? And they were full of meat. There were just too much. They, they, nobody could make up all these. Uh, for example, perhaps it's not true that Christman was the first person Shaw called and the first person Beckham called. And perhaps this other thing over here isn't true. But there are just too many things. Uh, and uh, the man uh, in each case, and at least two, uh, then you have the interview by a man named Lavender in Seattle, who apparently knew him very well. I don't know how we got the lead from him. Uh, he could have possibly written the first anonymous letter, but the language sounds like he might have made a reference to it. And uh, in any case, he was a former friend split in some way, and he did not indicate what they had in common, uh, whether it was uh, involvement in a, some kind of conservative movement. They had something in common, but then he split because he had too many details. So we had from Lavender, by the time of the grand jury, we had the statement from Lavender. We had the, the two very meaty uh, um, anonymous letters, and I had seen a clear picture of the grassy knoll, which, uh, which um, made him look like a good prospect, is the most conservative way to put it. And it's not the blonding. Now, when picture. you served him, you served him in where, in Washington, Seattle? I, I think we got from, uh, if I remember right, I think we got his exact address from, from this fellow Lavender. We served him in Tacoma, either yeah. Tacoma or Olympia. Was he totally taken by surprise? Because here's a man who may have been advising other people how to avoid the uh, reciprocal well, witness that, statutes. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm going to make a note to do that too because uh, I have I put those different things in. That leads me to another thing. That's that's I don't know how we got it, but we got that interview with the newsman of Christmas. Uh, that's right. This is the television. Well, if it, it might be useful for each of us in our own way to take those parts or reproduce those parts of Christmas. Uh, that I put in, in Beckham because I feel that Beckham, it's, it was an aspect of Beckham that's important. But I haven't done this. I haven't put him in a file marked Christmas and just looked at those alone with Beckham out of the way. I might see more. So I'm going to start a Christmas file right now. I mean, uh, when you all leave with that stuff and then see how it looks. And then uh, perhaps uh, I can develop a chronology, but right now I don't have it. Uh, perhaps I can with the grand jury, because I must have had in there four hours. I, I know I, I don't. Uh, I, I usually have them there as long as the grand jury will put up with it, because you never know. I want them to get tired, especially if they're confident. You never know what you get in the fourth or fifth hour. But as I recall, in these two cases, the grand jury got tired first. You can't bore the jury, because you want them to be in it looking forward to next week. But I say that was a long questioning. It had to be productive. But uh, my intuition has been pretty good in this case uh, so far, and I'm confident that it's right about Christmas. Just as I'm confident it's right about a man we haven't even talked about yet, uh, George Lyman Payne, but it's that, that we'll have to wait for a separate trip for that. But I'll start trying to I'll put that on the future agenda. Um, George Lyman Payne. You see, just to, I don't know if I even start. Maybe I'll say that just before we, we Yeah, we say, go. say George. Um, I've got, because he's critically important, I'm sure, uh, with regard to what you're looking into, but it's kind of involved. Let me take you off that thought for a minute. Let's go back okay. and talk about the Balfour building. We have a building for the offices of Free Cuba. We've got the same building with offices of G. Ray Gill and the same building. Well, the third factor about the, uh, all I remember about the building itself, the two things in the building. <coughs> two things in the building. Um, <coughs> Ray Gill's office and the Cuban operation. 
The third thing about the building is it was across the street from the CIA. Which was what? The, in the Masonic Temple, where it still is. Pretty sure. They don't no longer put their address in there, but it was across the Masonic Temple at the time. But anyway, those are three. Oh, the, the fourth thing is that uh, Jack Martin, who's never lied to me uh, in all the years I've known him, although uh, he's, he's not the most prepossessing person. Again, he's a person you get leads from, and not, uh, but don't use his evidence. Uh, I showed him this guy's picture. It was just seeing where he'd seen it. Uh -huh. And uh, if he'd ever seen him around Guy Bannister's office, and he said, uh, I've seen him, but the only place I've seen it was always at the Baltimore. So you're saying that uh, Jack Martin said that he'd seen Howard Hunt in the vicinity of the Baltimore like, building? He said something like, that's Howard Hunt. I've seen him at the Baltimore building several times. He said been, in the Baltimore building, not, not around Bannister's no. office. And this would have been approximately... I think in connection with either Cubans or Bannister, I don't know which. And this was approximately 1962, 61, 62? Um, Whenever, before they, they moved to 544. That was, if, if it had been, since we've been touching everything, I, I would have gotten an exact statement, but that was sometime last summer or something when, when they came by, so, and I had that picture, so in a casual conversation, because, you know, things were kind of surfacing about uh, uh, the, the, the background of Sturgis and Hunt being a little more uh, substantial than, than we might have thought, you know, so. He says in the Balta building, in connection with the Cubans or Bannister, I don't remember which, but we'll be talking to him at great length. Yeah. Uh, I, I let, let me ask you I this. I don't think I've ever asked him about Thornberry. Mrs. Stern. Mrs. Stern. Did she ever stay at the Claymore Towers? I would seriously doubt it because uh, even when it was new, it's gone down a great deal now, but even if it's new, it wouldn't be elegant enough for her. She was. I have to remember, she was the heir, is the heir to the uh, Sears Roebuck, the uh, Feebleman family. And uh, they have millions and millions. Uh, they built WDSU. Yeah, no. I, I was she thinking on terms with. She had such a beautiful. Uh, if she stayed any place uh, temporarily while they remodeled her home out on uh, Bamboo Road, it would be someplace like the Poncha Train. <coughs> that would be too commercial for her. Why? No, it was something that came up about a woman staying at the Claymore Towers with a lot of money. Oh, well, uh, it wouldn't be Mrs. Stern, it wouldn't. Um, Were there any other elderly or well-to-do right-wing heiresses that... Uh, she's a liberal. She was... Uh, um, I guess I, I suppose basically I'm a liberal. In fact, uh, I think I mentioned the Stearns wanted me to run for mayor a few years before I grabbed their favorite party go by the ass. After that, they didn't bring up the subject. But uh, she was she she's uh, ultra liberal, ultra liberal. Came across another possible lead. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to turn it into a memo of uh, make it more. Constructive, uh, put it in the turn it in the more, but I thought I'd give you a look at it. This is a um, memo I picked up some years ago and found yesterday evening going through some of my older files, and the subject is Breck Wall, oh, yeah. and it really ends up being a credit rating um, check. If you remember, we were talking about the Galveston factor, and we noticed how there was an indication of, uh, of a pattern of travel of individuals, not only to Galveston, but an overall subtle inference that there, were, uh, there was a kind of a, a command force of some kind because of the separate people coming in from New Orleans, and we, we put that on the side for future speculation. I've got some thoughts about how we might be able to get our foot in that door. But anyway, uh, somebody 
I appreciated their services enough to reward them uniquely, as you know, because I made the notes. So I thought you might want to see the main credit reference of Rack Walgate. It's all bullshit till you get to the last page. Earlier memo I gave you, which I think is is really interesting because uh, um, Thornley is uh, because I started out just to see what the situation might look like and went through a bunch of books and I find a blank there and he fits in with the blank. But I'm, I'm finished with my tongue in my cheek about his father being a photo engraver. Uh, I just want to make one point so you don't close your minds to that. Naturally, it goes without saying that if his father is, <coughs> as you would assume, the average American and his son is an intelligence, so he can't go back to something that hot for his father. But you've always got to keep in mind that we see a pattern in this case of uh, the intelligence community being made up of families. So if don't close your door to the possibility of his father having been the original one in intelligence and the result of Kerry Thornby ending up in it, then um, such a thing is, isn't as hard to digest. I'll give you an example. I, without going into it at the moment, I have good reason to believe that George Lyman Payne, the father of Michael Payne, is in intelligence. That is very, intelligence families are very useful for, for a variety of reasons. That's why you can take a couple who compared to most of the people in this case are relatively clean cut, Ruth Payne and Michael Payne. Uh, he's productive and she's relatively sensitive and intelligent. And they're both part of the intelligence community. She uh, impressed me as being what you would call a Jack Kennedy Democrat, yet somehow they're manipulated. I suggest that the reason they were able to manipulate them, and the reason they're frozen, is not only her family, which is AID, intelligence family, but also his family, his father, George Lyman Payne. If his father, as I suggest events may well bear out, turns out to be the case agent of Lee Harvey Oswald in Los Angeles, then it's very likely that he will also turn out to be the case agent of Kerry Thornley. It's very possible that George Lyman Payne may turn out to be the one person who originally knew both Thornley and Oswald in their formative stages in intelligence. And if that were so, you could assume that, of course, the Thornley would be seeing him out there during the summer of 63, which might have been a major reason for his going, I might add, because he is about to have a lot of assignments, in addition to having apparently executed at least one. But what I'm getting to is, assume that for a moment, and you can see how Ruth Payne and the pain, pains are so jammed, they don't even have to check with them. They don't even have to indicate we have an operation we'd like to have. It's just, it's just that we have somebody we'd like to have you take in your house. They have them for the balls, not only for their own futures, the years they've been instructed not to pay income tax, but uh, <coughs> uh, there's always their father, their uncle, or God knows what. Uh, so, uh, don't dismiss too lightly the fact that Thornley's father is a photo engraver, that, because if that's an intelligence community family, as it well may be, then the photo engraver may have come first and Thornley later, in which case if Thornley came back with some nasty pictures, then there's no problem at all with the family. Just, just, okay, here's something you might want to do some thinking about. Uh, and this was provoked when I came across this small uh, little bullshit, almost irrelevant thing about Breck Wall until at the end when you see that reference. Then all of a sudden his activities in Galveston and the subsequent reward 
make you think again about who's sending the message from New Orleans to Galveston by ferry, apparently, to this guy. Who, or to shorten it, who's sending a message by courier from New Orleans to, to Breck Law? Who's sending a message to Ruby by courier from New Orleans on the, uh, the other route? The, um, that caused me to speculate about, <coughs> I think uh, you were here when I was speculating about the possibility, even though we were just brainstorming, of this being a kind of uh, command post where people are removed from the people making command decisions. Now, why would people making command decisions be removed? Why wouldn't they rather be at the Adolphus, where they could, in 30 seconds, make a change here or there? Thinking out loud, I suggest that if these people were well known enough, uh, that would make them so sensitive that for all they know, uh, their very presence in Dallas could evoke possible questions and make them witnesses later, so that they would want to be in another town, knowing that for any inquiry by the FBI and having a pretty good idea what the federal inquiry is probably going to be like, it would be just enough not to be in Dallas for the name not to even come up. Then that reminded me, I don't know why I had a delayed reminder, but it was in the last uh, it was last night, sitting this thing, I said, I realized, hell, they had something happening in New Orleans on November 22nd, 1963, that would have been an excuse, it would have been an excuse for um, uh, unusually patriotic man, Americans' leaders, so to speak, to come to New Orleans. In other words, instead of, if it ever were looked into, saying, uh, having to say it rather lamely, like, Thornley, I've always wanted to go to New Orleans. There was a reason to come here. A speaker, um, basically a conservative, named Harold Lord Varney was speaking on the, uh, I think, midday or something like that, of the 22nd of November. The point is, have you ever heard of him? No. Well, I think he's an Englishman. And if he is a lord, well, I want to take another look at uh, Shaw's notebook. Uh, not just for his name, but for something that may lead to him. But I, I have a feeling that most of those Princess Giuseppe and so forth are uh, really a, a kind of a fascist structure. Because what we're dealing with, regardless of the intelligence aspect, is a conservative clique within the intelligence. In other words, you look closely at uh, what we do know of Christmas activities and banisters, and I found a, a part of this file, which I, I want to go through and then send to you, and you find that you're dealing with uh, a, a, a combination that repeats again and again, not merely intelligence, but ultra, an ultra-conservative clique. Anyway, Harold Lord Varney is an important enough speaker to draw a notice in the paper. And so that's why we have to get the story about Harold Lord Varney's speech from the item afternoon edition on the 22nd and from the picking on the morning because it was in both. And even when I didn't question the assassination, um, just thinking it was, you know, another uh, nut, lonely nut. Uh, that stuck in my mind, and the reason it stuck in my mind is that General Walker came all the way from Dallas, Texas, to hear this man speak. In fact, they said, General Walker in town for speech, or something like that. I got interested enough that, uh, just out of curiosity about that part, I, I checked how, uh, where he went after he left town, I found out that uh, shortly after the speech he went to the airport and flew up to Shreveport for some unknown reason. 
But what I'm getting to is if Varney, I think his uh, speech was uh, uh, either patriotism or the importance of the uh, the Anglo-American tradition, blah, blah. It's the kind of thing that, uh, uh, that uh, at that time he was important. His star had descended. Uh, God knows who else was in attendance there. So it occurs to me it might be worth finding out what hotel he was speaking at because it might have been a nice cover for some um, um, very conservative but otherwise distinguished Americans to have come to town for a day or so. The, um, it, when you read some of the Minuteman type rhetoric in the Bannisters collecting and part, a little part of his father, that's almost verbatim the rhetoric that uh, General Cavill spoke when he was a spokesman for the military warfare sector. He was really the last from intelligence, I, I guess because of the Bay of Pigs and his getting fired. But I got interested in him enough uh, when I dug into his getting fired and the reason he got fired and his criticism of Kennedy as a traitor and so forth and the subsequent actions of his brother in Dallas to, to dig through his speeches in the, uh, uh, in, I, I got the index of current periodicals and uh, somewhere I have a collection of capital speeches and uh, they're really indistinguishable from, uh, you might say, uh, an educated Billy Ray Hargis, um, or um, a lucid uh, General Walker, <laughs> is a good way to put it. But it is not far removed from General Walker. Every speech by Cabell is, the Russians are coming. The Russians are coming. So he wasn't just a high-class technician like you have in the case of Colby. Colby is uh, almost the perfect technician uh, in the sense that uh, I'm not sh sure he has any clear, uh, 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 as, as a leader of the CIA, and a clear conscious political commitment. He's just the ultimate technician. He really belongs to the Germans. But what I'm getting to is that could well have been a cover to allow, and speaking of long shots, sure, but we made a lot of progress for long shots. That could well have been a cover to allow someone like uh, um, a General Cavill from uh, where he was, he was uh, during that time, I think, an advisor, became an advisor to the uh, aerocraft business and so forth, to come down from Washington, or Mitch Werbel, or whoever, to come down to New Orleans to, to hear him speak and put a few um, uh, key people in the, in the hotel here. There must have been, parenthetically, there must have been some reason for Bruce Ray Collins' hesitation about what hotel he was staying at. And uh, there must be some meaning towards a bum, for a bum like uh, Frank Wall to be able to give the name Cabell. Anyway, just when you get a chance, if you go by the Picayune and for the 22nd, the afternoon paper, the 22nd, November. 63, and the next one, the Picayune, it, uh, I don't know how the thing works, but you can go through the whole paper somewhere. You're going to find a speech given by Harold Lord Varney of England, and apparently some rather important people attending, and it may name the others, but some of them, but it names General Walker among them, and it names the hotel where he's speaking. Now, earlier, these years up to now, that probably would have been premature to look into, but uh, I think the pattern of, uh, of writers coming from here is enough to start looking into something like that, and then maybe, maybe we can get a guest list after that. I just, I just can't yeah, Robert Connor. Who was, who was Robert Connor? Her uncle lived here. Well, I recall her uncle did indeed live here several doors, and I was, uh, this goes to the point of who sent him there, who initiated it, who set this up, because it is plainly a scenario. It might not have, it wasn't plainly that to me, say, uh, six months ago, but that was before we started brainwashing and found, with, as we developed a KT file, an uh, accumulation of scenarios. And Jesus Christ, especially after you read the Whitman thing, the Whitworth thing, that is so strong, that's strong as well, I mean, you, you know, here's, when she comes and says it wasn't me, but here's somebody who's going down the line 
but even she can't swallow this scenario. But what I'm saying is, then when I read the audio thing, all of a sudden it's so clear that that's a scenario that I get interested in the question of a uh, possible source of uh, the initiation of it. So I looked up <coughs> Dr. Augustine Guitart's come across this some time ago, part of a Mr. the old memo of ours. He, Dr. Gittard, her uncle, lived several doors from, uh, from, Je from, from David Ferry, and then I put a little P.S., and so did Mr. and Mrs. Klepfer, Ruth Payne's visitors to Oswald. Um, that's another subject. Uh, I'll try and construct a memo on it if you want, but that looks like it was a little intelligence community. Uh, structure there on Louisiana Avenue Park. And of course, right. Howard Hunt would know so the ODS father as being part of the underground. Yeah. If he was the political liaison for General Cabell, he certainly would know. He'd know all about it. And, and uh, that, that's, that scene shows a sophisticated insight. The way that scene is set up shows a sophisticated insight of, of a Howard Hunt, who, uh, I'm, I, 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 as a matter of fact, I recall uh, from his one book, he can't mention the name Manilo Rai without a diatribe, in other words, because he considers him an ultra-liberal. So one of the things that accomplishes to some extent, I think, is to suggest that uh, Rai could be behind it. So they're throwing his name in there rather loosely. Throwing in J-U-R-E, not throwing in D-R-E, or the... Uh, Cuban Revolutionary Council, both of which are useful to the agency, throwing in the liberal Cuban. It's important to keep in mind that I think it's more than just an interesting coincidence that uh, her uncle, Dr. Augustine Guitar, lived at 3694 Louisiana Avenue Parkway, and Ferry lived at 3328 Louisiana Avenue Parkway for this reason, and this is worth keeping in mind. First of all, uh, we've already agreed, we, for a few days ago, we began to realize we have to consider the possibility now of not only Thornley, but Oswald also being in Mexico. Um, my, correct me if my recollection is wrong, but I don't think the, the record has Oswald coming back from Mexico to Dallas till around the 2nd of October. He checks out of the Hotel Del Comercio August 1st. It's the last... August? No, uh, October 1st. October is the, 1st. Is the last day... No. His name does not appear on the register October 1st, 1963. It does appear on the 27th of September, 1963. They, he signed in, and they carried his name over on the ledger each additional day without him having to sign it, according to their hotel policy, which can be manipulated. But his name does not appear on the register October 1st, so they, they assume that he was out by that day. And I think about October 2, he shows up in Dallas, and the point I don't, the point I don't remember. But here's what I'm getting to. One thing that Odio remembers specifically is that this visit was the last few days of September. She knows that. She says, in the last days of September. And when I say, how do you know that? She explains, well, they had just finished, they were finishing packing, and uh, approximately October the 1st, they moved to the new apartment. So the point is, that decreases the likelihood that it was the actual Oswald, and moves us again to our scenario we keep encountering where Oswald is not available and then Oswald in quotes is appearing. Now, that being the case, I want to suggest that the location of her uncle might be interesting in helping us get a clearer picture as to possibilities, just to keep in mind in the worksheet or keep in the back of our mind of the origin of the idea of stopping there. The activity of the banister ferry axis with regard to Cubans down here ranges from the rabid uh, ultra-conservative DRE to the, um, well, it's also conservative, but it's more of a, it's more of a structure than anything else, the revolutionary Cuban front. So 
neither one of those have mentioned. So one thing that's clear when you see this as a scenario is that J-U-R-E had nothing to do with it. Somebody from a conservative uh, viewpoint interested in the Cuban situation is setting up a scenario perhaps uh, apparently intended to make <coughs> Manolo Rye look bad and J-U-R-E and so forth. Well, that fits the Bannister Lindbergh Lindbergh, Lindbergh is a nickname <laughs> yes. we have for Axis. But here's what I'm suggesting. The surfacing, um, so far as we know so far, of the of a man who is called Leon Oswald and needs a shave because he's a slob. Oswald was always neat as a pin. Every neighbor testifies to that. Is at David Ferry's. Leon needs a shave. That's at 3328 Louisiana Avenue Parkway, and a few days, a few doors away, you have her uncle. I'm just suggesting that may not be a mere coincidence. It suggests the likelihood that that uh, Bannister ferry access and everything it implies is back of this visit. It seems to me that since the official version is the visitors knew of Sylvia or her sister, according to sources in Cuba, they point the finger at the father who lives in Cuba and away from any possible involvement. Oh, of, but they're getting all they're this. Protecting they're, they're it, they're protecting the this. guy here in New Orleans by sure. using that as the front. It makes perfectly good sense. The father, the father writes back and says he's on yeah, friends right. of mine and nothing about him at all. But Augustine Guitar, the uncle, is, is able to give all those details <laughs> to these guys, the guy that lives near Ferry. So that might, might not be totally relevant. Anyway, I just wanted to talk about a couple other things. I'm going to break fairly early, and I'm sure you all do. But uh, um, I think that uh, we ought to think in terms of, uh, I know that you've got Beckham problems. And, but when you can, of course, you're going to be getting the KT because of the priority. Certain witnesses are <coughs> so useless that we have listed on here. We have a kind of timetable. Uh, but. Uh, in some cases, there's some people you can really save to last if you see it all. And one would be the, like the incident at the Havana Bar, the vomiting. Uh, between Aristopenia uh, on the one hand and uh, Evaristo Rodriguez and so forth, you just end up with more and more confusion. It leads nowhere. Uh, I know one man who spent and made a career of, of Pena. Uh, named Weisberg, and he's half nuts as a result because it leads nowhere. You know he has some tie-in with some form of intelligence because he's traveling all over the fucking world. And every time he remembers something, it's different. But it does not clarify the KTLO situation. So just, in other words, so what you would do would be to put that in parentheses and just have it on the list or something and start concentrating on the 1961 and 1962 appearances like uh, Bolton Ford most especially. Mr. Sewell was fairly well along in years and we talked to him uh, some years back. He would be one of the most important because you have, uh, he remembers in more detail. That's uh, rather obvious but I felt impelled to make the point uh, that uh, when you can get to KT uh, we want to get into those as soon as we can that uh, Dumas salesman and so forth. And also, those are our best chances, too, better than the Dallas people will have, even though we know that both, uh, we know the downtown Lincoln Mercury is a scenario. Uh, we've had the lesson from uh, Mrs. Whitman's furniture store that uh, once the assassination occurred there, whoever they saw, a lot of people are going to decide is Oswald. But these people down here in 61 and 62 haven't had it pressed into their brains as Oswald. Their minds are relatively open compared to Dallas. I think we have a better chance of identification. One person or another said, that's sure interesting. We know you're telling us the truth. But Oswald was in Russia at the time. So the point is, the door isn't closed then. If a Sewell doesn't remember, then a Noto will. If he doesn't remember, then one of the other. But this is the richest load area for KT. And 61 and 62 is the priority. It's, it's apparent, but I, I, I want to underscore the point. Don't you agree? As soon as we can, because see, it's from that area that we've got our best chance of 
getting your employers interested, but they're going to want, they're going to find the structure interesting, I'm, I'm sure, when they, as they see it develop. I found some new leads, some new scenarios that I'm going to have to put together for you. I'll find them faster than I can get them organized. But right now, these are pretty rich to start with, and we come up with a few identifications in a few weeks, that's liable to be the difference between the subpoena and no subpoena. And he does have a distinct look. As a matter of fact, Mrs. Uh, Whitaker, these two old ladies, at the same time they say, yes, those are the two. You've got uh, Ms. Harper, whatever her name is, saying, but it's amazing how they can fix people up because she sure is pretty now. She was really awful when she came to the store. But she's pretty now. But that's her. <coughs> and uh, by the same tone, token, Mrs. Whitman, but this is interesting. She describes uh, how the other, uh, when he appeared at the furniture store, he seemed to have a much sweeter uh, sweeter expression, I think, that uh, Thornley tends to have in his pictures. And, and uh, uh, Oswald has, uh, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't show that. Somewhere along the line, I can't remember who I read last night, one of the scenarios talks, it, I don't I remember whether it is Odeo trying to identify a picture, it may be at one point, I know you're stopping to get it, but at some point, she said, I thought his lips were thicker than that, There's something like that. Either she said that or one of the ladies said that. Hmm. And, uh, yeah, well, that's, that's the, but anyway, that's the best chance the best chance of getting that subpoena. Once they get an excuse to get the subpoena out, I don't know how much lead time they have. Let's say for the sake of argument, three weeks. There's plenty of time to build a good structure, but the first thing we got to try and get is a couple IDs, which would, which would give them enough confidence and, you know, that uh, they're not just going nowhere. But I think that after that, some of the other things that we can get to, uh, we can put together pretty, pretty let steadily. Me, uh, let me see if I can jog your memory a little bit on some other points in this area. Were there other places that they met that you, you came across other than Ryder, other than the Macuso Cafe? Yeah, I wonder, oh, I wonder, this, this is a matter of record, if I, if we can, if the place still exists, I wonder you remind me of, uh, of, uh, Beatham Hotel? The Beatham. Beatham. The Macbeath. Macbeath. I don't know if it still exists. Let me look it up because I found a correlation there that's not possibly accidental, and I don't know how the hell I found it. I guess yeah. <laughs> it's like my pattern, but it's my piece. Apparently, it doesn't exist anymore. It was on Napoleon. Uh, Thornley mentions at one time living around the corner from his girlfriend, uh, Jessica Luck, I think it was. I think it's before the hack. Jessica Luck. And uh, that apparently was the time he stayed at the McBeath Hotel. Little tiny hole in the wall somewhere near Ferret on Napoleon. You might still be able to find a directory, and the owner might be retired old man. Uh, Undoubtedly, our pages of the directory, or at least photographs of the pages, are in the Thornley file, which I guess box little more. I know the area you're talking about. Now they got medical classes and uh, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, but it's really, if you could ever find uh, through an old city directory, it just here's what it had in it. Um, for some reason, I am looking at that area because in the grand jury testimony, I think he said he lived on Napoleon. And I think he might have mentioned the McBeath. I can't be sure. Well, I got the register and went through it. And at a separate time, I no longer remember the date, there's a signature, Lee H. Oswald. In other words, that hotel is so out of the place. There's just no way. Where would this copy of this register be that you got? It'd be in the, it'd be in the Carrie Thornley file, which is removed. I, I, I've had to reconstruct the new file right in front of you because they got, they got, uh, got into us. Okay, now he, if, if they... But that's, uh, that may be our photographs of the register which still exists. I can't remember at the moment. Now, 
But the, until we can develop that, naturally, that's... They don't but you do recall it. having seen it and oh, seen without it. any question, sure. Uh, in other words, I can put in the form of a memo for the time being until we... we uh, against the hope that we locate. The, but you weren't thinking at the time in terms of this big summer here in 63 and Thornley supposedly being in California. Did you come across Thornley's name in that register? I came across Thornley's name in the register because he either said he stayed there or we heard he stayed there. And do you recall the date? Then, oh no, no. I don't recall any conflict. I don't recall any problem. As a matter of fact, if I found, if we were able to find it, and I found that Thornley is registered in the middle of the, of the summer of 63, I would be pleased rather than dismayed because to me it would mean he came back if it appeared to be right. right. That's what I'm hoping. Yeah, but I do remember just making myself check all the names. As a matter of course, I had I had not heard it stated the same place. And then when I found Lee H. Oswald <coughs> at this offbeat place, which Thornley stayed at, well, that was too much. Co that's, that's a correlation factor. Uh, but naturally, they're looking for more up there. That's the kind of stuff that we want. We so, have cooperation. And, and, and that's physical. But no, but the, in other words, the writer thing is is uh, is nice as as it stands, and so is the bourbon thing. But then you add to that both of them being at the McBeef, the impossible for that's two pretty people. hard, and that's on doc. That's documented. Absolutely. If uh, if you could find, record, that's the kind of. Hard there might be a group on the. You, you, you think of right now in the police force and know that area and see the McBeath Hotel oh, that was torn down uh, X years ago to make room for such and such, but that used to be run by old man so and so who lived so and so, and it was our custom, uh, maybe not in the case of the Ryder uh, Coffee House, but it was just a scribbled piece of paper. But something like that, it was our custom, say, to photograph the pages of the ledger for even a small hotel and give it back. So I think it's very likely that we gave it back since it was a hotel in existence when we found it. Now, that's one of those things we found just by, like the 300 witnesses at Clinton, by going farther than the Bureau would ever go. But uh, we should add that to our list of... Uh, I'll make a memo on it so you'll at least have it called to your attention, and then meanwhile you can try and remember. Well, it was in that case. That's for Rhett Napoleon's, not too far away from Louisiana Parkway. Is well, that might be recommended by our friend, and I didn't realize that. Well, you, you, well, you know the area. It's not that far from Louisiana.